Hare Krishna, everyone, and welcome to this week's Sunday Feast program. On behalf of Sri Sri Kishore Kishori and Srila Prabhupada, a big welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining. A couple of quick announcements before we continue on with uh, what will be a very exciting Sunday Feast program for everybody. Uh, the first is that the temple remains closed, though thankfully uh, COVID is starting to back off a little bit but still the temple remains closed, but hopefully uh, we'll have some good news for everybody soon, but more details to come on that. Uh, also a reminder for everyone that is inspired to participate, we have daily Japa calls from five until 7 a.m. That's daily. And connection information is available through the weekly temple email. If you're not currently receiving it, just send a message either on YouTube or the Zoom chat, and I'm happy to get you added to the list. Uh, finally, I'll turn it over to a recent addition of our virtual Sunday feast program, where we've recently started singing Nursima prayers again. Uh, and today's Nursima prayers are going to be sung by Krishangi and Chaitanya. So thank you so much for this. And then following that, I'll introduce tonight's speaker. Namaste. Thank you. 
Krishna, thank you so much for that. Uh, very grateful to you for uh, being able to share and lead us in Narasimha prayers. Hi, Krishna. And uh, just as a note uh, for everyone who's joining us, the Narasimha prayers are being sung every week by participants in Radhakund Mataji's Vamsi Vaishnav's uh, singing uh, in music school. So uh, this is a way for the young devotees to showcase uh, what they're what they're learning and express their devotion in a way that um, you know we can all appreciate and come together in this way. So big thank you as well to their teacher. Uh, finally, I'll turn it over to tonight's guest speaker, His Grace Jai Chaitanya Prabhu. Um, many of us may know Jai Chaitanya Prabhu, but for those of you that don't, uh, he comes to us from Los Angeles. Although he's been in the ashram in New York as well as India. And uh, some of you, especially those that are more inclined toward book distribution, may know him uh, since he was noted as the number one book distributor 2015 through 2017, and has also spoken at the ISKCON Leadership Sangha on how to reach the millennial generation with this Krishna consciousness. Uh, in addition to that, um, he's established multiple successful uh, meditation clubs at UCLA and University of Southern California and is currently involved in a lot of different, really exciting and innovative projects um, to help spread this mission. So one of them uh, that I'm particularly fond of is Good Luck Yogi, uh, where he co-founded uh, this business that uh, creates, uh, it's, it's an assisted guided meditation device for children to help with uh, mindfulness meditation. So especially in this time of turmoil, I think that this is a, a wonderful thing um, so I'm very grateful to you for uh, accepting this invitation to speak to the congregation, and I'll turn it over to you as he continues our Brilliant as the Sun series with an overview of Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, fifth chapter, which he has titled, Be a Honeybee. Haribo. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for having me be part of this uh, Chicago Sangha. Chicago is a very special place for me. Um, it's where my spiritual master, His Holiness Radhanath Swami, comes from. So to me, Chicago is like a holy theater, and all of you guys are residing in a holy theater. Um, I even remember early on in my Krishna conscious journey, when I was first reading Srila Prabhupada's books, I, um, I didn't have any devotee association. 
and I had so many questions regarding the philosophy. So I used to go to the back of the Bhagavad Gita and look at all the different centers from North America. And I would try to call each and every single one to answer or to ask them all of my questions. And nobody would pick up their phone. But uh, there were some temples that did, and Chicago was one of them. And I remember I would call them very frequently. This was back in 2012, and just have a bunch of philosophical questions, and they were there to answer. So, yes, very indebted to Chicago. I think also Krishna says that he, he um, places a lot of blessings upon um, those that protect the cows and bulls. And I believe you guys have a basketball team called Chicago Bulls. So um, once again, the glories just keep rolling on and on. Um, so yeah, it's really wonderful. Actually, it's, it's funny. Um, they, you know, we have a GBC, right? So Krishna also has a GBC. Um, what's Krishna's GBC? It's a uh, Govardhan, bulls and cows. Um, so that's how Krishna is guided as well. Um, and excited about uh, just speaking about today's topic, which is be a, uh, a honeybee. I'm actually, uh, lately I've been eating kind of like a Goswami diet. That's what I call it. Just really reducing um, the things that I eat. And my new dinner every day has been uh, three spoons of honey. So uh, I was very excited to uh, talk about being a honeybee. It's, uh, it just seems in, in alignment. Um, and this is really inspired by one of the verses coming from the fifth, chanter, fifth uh, chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the third canto. Uh, we're reading about how Vidura um, approaches Maitreya. Uh, currently, Maitreya is in the Haridwar. Um, city uh, right next to the Ganga River and Vidura comes to him and he's very excited to see Maitreya and this is how we should also be when we see great sages great devotees there's this feeling of excitement you even see that in um, the culture that we have one of the first things we do is we hit the floor and we pay our respects and offer our obeisances you just don't really see this outside in the normal material world so this um, amount of love and bhakti that we share amongst each other as devotees um, is, is very special. And so Vidura is meeting Maitreya and Vidura has so many questions. Um, kind of reminds me of when I was calling all those temples, but this is a little different. Uh, Vidura is asking and wanting to know so much about the Lord. He wants to hear all of these glorifications he wants to learn about the manifestation of the material universe and just go deeper and deeper into the leelas and the rasas and Maitreya is so excited to answer all these questions so um it's from uh text 15 which i can read to you very quickly of this uh chapter that says oh Maitreya oh friend of the distressed the glories of the Supreme Lord can alone do good for people all over the world. Therefore, just as bees collect honey from flowers, kindly describe the essence of all topics, the topics of the Lord. So uh, this is where we get the topic of uh, being like a honeybee. And one of the first things a honeybee is known for is finding the essence. And this is also stemmed later on from the 11th canto. It's uh, text or it's chapter number 10 and text number eight. And this is really easy to remember because you just think of 11th canto and then you think of um, 108. So uh, chapter 10, uh, text eight, or no, sorry, chapter eight, text 10. You just got to reverse it a little. But here you see another verse that says, just as the honeybee takes nectar from all flowers, big and small, an intelligent human being should take the essence from all 
uh, religious scriptures. So this is one of the first things we notice about the honeybee, that a honeybee, um, it's not concerned so much about the thorns, about the sharp edges of a, a flower. Um, it simply goes for the nectar. And this is how we make our life more sweet when we do not necessarily see the sharp edges and thorns um, of others, but we happen to simply see the nectar. There's uh, two types of insects out there. There is the, the fly and there's the honeybee. And what happens when you see the fly? The fly is always hovering over uh, dirty things. It goes for the open sores. It finds the wounds. But the bee, the bee is not concerned with all this. It simply just goes for the nectar. So in the same way, um, we can apply this type of understanding to then uh, make our lives more sweet um, by just seeing the good in others. And this is explained in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. There's a, a concept called Adosha Darshi. Um, we know Darshi comes from Darshan, that means to see. And Dosha means false, um, not Dosa, that's like a South Indian dish, but Dosha. Dosha means false. Um, actually, the dosa has no faults. It's incredible. Uh, but back to dosha. Dosha means faults. Adosha means no faults. So adosha darshi is having the ability to see the goodness in others and also not seeing the faults in life. And this was really exemplified by uh, great saints like Haridas Thakur, who was always seeing the good in others, even when they were beating him. They were beating him in 22 marketplaces. He was still um, asking for these um, people's blessings and to please, Lord, shower your mercy on them. And you see this also in different uh, religions with other saints like Lord Jesus Christ. So Adosha Darshi, that is the vision of the bee. And that is the vision of the devotee as well. And if we can have this vision, then we can again make our life uh, more sweet. Um, this this kind of reminds me of a story. It's a little personal, but I, I will share it. Um, when I first joined the ashram, I was taking uh, Bhakti Shastri courses. And one of the first things I learned was that we're not supposed to put our hands in our mouths and we're not supposed to pick our noses and we're not supposed to put our uh, fingers in our ears because uh, we can if, if we do that, of course, but then we have to like wash our hands right away. Um, and uh, what happened was during the Bhagavatam classes, I would always sit in the back and there were all these other new bhaktas who just learned all this information that I learned about the nose and uh, picking your nose and you're putting your finger in your mouth, etc. And during the Bhagavatam class, as I'm trying to like pay attention, there they one of them like puts his finger in his mouth. I'm like, oh man, he's not supposed to do that. And then another one's like picking his nose. I'm like, oh man, I, I can't look. And then another one's putting his finger in his ear. I'm like, oh man. And I'm seeing all these faults and I'm like, oh, what do I do? Um, and the way I was able to solve that situation was then I started sitting right next to the Bhagavatam speaker. I was like right at the footstep. So now everyone was kind of um, behind and I couldn't see what was going on. And I simply saw the speaker. Um, and this is just kind of a understanding or a realization I had about how if we are very close to our service, if we stay in that fire, then we don't actually see faults. But if we're more in a distant and we're kind of like just overseeing and we're not even doing anything, that's when we start to see faults in life. So if we can just get close, if we can get close to the fire and if we can be connected to our service at a more deeper level, then the faults um, evaporate, you can say. So um, this was just something that uh, I learned from 
that experience and uh, it's another lesson of the bee. Uh, also sannyasis, they also take lessons from the bee because a bee is always moving from flower to flower and a sannyasi is meant to move from place to place because sometimes it's actually shown in National Geographic that if a bee stays in one spot for too long in, in a flower for too long, it kind of gets eaten up. So um, sannyasis take the lesson uh, from the bee in moving from place to place. And another thing, another way that we can um, understand the bee uh, is this term called madukari. Uh, what is madukari? Madukari is uh, begging. That is a term given to brahmacharis and sannyasis, but it comes from the bee. Madhu means sweet. And so as a bee is collecting sweetness from others um, in the same fashion, when we do madukari, we're simply looking for the nectar from others. And um, I, in fact, I feel personally that anytime we see a honeybee, we should think of Srila Prabhupada because it's simply through his Marukari that we have these books, that we have this movement. Back in 1962, he was performing Marukari just like the bee and he was going to different um, gentlemen's places. Sometimes he would wait five, six hours just to get a small donation so he can print his Srima Bhagavatam first volume. He would sometimes walk long distances in the heat. Sometimes he got even a heat stroke. He fainted, he fell, and he was doing this all because he wanted to bring us these books to the West. So when we see the sweetness of the honeybee, we should also see the sweetness of Srila Prabhupada and the, sacrifice, the sacrifices that he has taken for us so we can now have this wisdom and knowledge. And Srila Prabhupada is a real example of somebody who is always trying to give the essence and um, seek the essence. There was a pastime when uh, Prabhupada went to Melbourne, Australia in 1974. He came in contact with uh, Franciscan monks. He went to a monk seminary and Prabhupada actually gave a talk there. And all of the disciples of Srila Prabhupada, they still remember this talk to this day. They still remember what happened at this event to this day because it was something beyond this world. And I don't know if any of you guys know about this pastime, but maybe I can share some details of what happened when Prabhupada went to this monk seminary. Um, he, Prabhupada gave his uh, talk and it simply dealt with finding the essence of all religions. And he was even glorifying uh, Jesus Christ. And then at the end, the monks asked uh, Srila Prabhupada what they thought, what Prabhupada thought of somebody named St. Francis, St. Francis of uh, Assisi. And like always, Prabhupada would say, well, what is his philosophy? And these monks said, well, he actually saw God everywhere. He would call, um, and he would call the birds his brother. He would call the sun his sister, or, or the moon his sister. He would call his son the father. He, he would talk and preach to the deers, and he was uh, seeing God everywhere. And Prabhupada's eyes opened up at this point. And he said, this, this is real God consciousness for one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me. I am never lost, nor is he ever lost in me. And Prabhupada went on glorifying St. Francis so deeply to the degree that the monks from the other religion, uh, they started to have tears in their eyes because they felt here's this Indian gentleman coming from a different tradition and he's glorifying our saint so deeply that this truly moves us. I mean, you can even imagine it uh, vice versa these days if 
someone from a different tradition came and they started glorifying Lord Chaitanya like anything once we explain to them our philosophy, it would deeply move us as well. So Srila Prabhupada was very much impressed by St. Francis. And again, Prabhupada was sharing the essence of what St. Francis was all about. And then at the end of this uh, event, Prabhupada said to the monks, let's have a kirtan. And Prabhupada explained that in our tradition, the way we call God is Krishna. And in your tradition, the way you call God is Christos. So we'll chant Hare Krishna, you chant Hare Christos. Um, and in that way, let's all celebrate God together. And again, the it was like one of the wildest kirtans ever. And the monks, again, were having tears in their eyes during this kirtan. And if you watch the Prabhupada memories, and if you see this footage, um, it's very, very amazing. So again, another way, like the honeybee, we are able to uh, seek the essence. And I've had many experiences as well, um, being a book distributor and just trying to find the commonality, um, trying to find the essence um, in even very troubling uh, situations. I remember one time when I was on a school campus, I approached a student and I showed him the Bhagavad Gita. I said, hey, bro, what's up? I think you'll really like this book, the Bhagavad Gita. It's all on higher consciousness. And, you know, I just went up to him. My, my approach is just very like friendly, chill, like, yo, what's up? Like that. And um, he, was, he, was, uh, he was like, oh, let me see this. And he looked at the book and before you know it, he kind of like, he goes like this and the book is coming up and down and then he grabs it really tight. It's a hardcover Bhagavad Gita and he throws it full speed at me. And um, I, I was a little bit shocked and I was also a little bit triggered. Usually I... I still have a lot of work to do when it comes to my anger. And sometimes I would get angry on book distribution with like security guards and police. But during this situation, I was actually praying uh, to Krishna that whole week. Like, please, I want to conquer my anger on book distribution. And then Krishna gave me this test. So here's this college student throws a Bhagavad Gita right at my face. And I remembered my prayer. So I took a deep breath. Um, but then the student began to speak. And he started saying that you're going to hell. And everyone around you is going to hell. Your family is going to hell. Um, and then he started to say that uh, Allah is the only God. And Allah is the only way. And everyone else deserves to get their head chopped off. And I realized at this point that I was dealing with an Islam extremist right in front of me. And I was just uh, praying to Krishna, what do I do in this situation? Um, and a little bit of a backstory. I, I used to be a music producer before joining uh, the temple. And my style of music was mixing uh, sounds of the East with hip hop culture. So I had um, something on my phone called the Nasheed. And while he was very angry and while he was saying these things, uh, and also a crowd was forming around us, all the other students were like excited, like, oh, let's see a fight. And, um, <laughs> and so uh, when this was happening, I, I looked at the student and I said, you know what? You're from the Islam culture. I think you have a beautiful culture. I actually have a nasheed on my phone. And he couldn't believe this. He said, what, you know what a nasheed is? I'm like, yeah, let me, let me play this for you real quick. And I took out my phone and I pressed play. And you guys can just imagine we're on this college campus. and All of a sudden this beautiful nasheed comes into the sky. And what a nasheed is, is it, it's an Islamic Kirtan. It's an a cappella kirtan that's all about devotional service to the Lord. And it has beautiful harmonies and amazing lyrics. 
And as this kirtan, this Islamic kirtan, this nasheed was entering the sky, I could see tears starting to form into this student's eyes. And then he looked at me deeply and he said, you know, you're making such an effort to learn about my culture. Let me make an effort to learn about yours. And he took the Bhagavad Gita. And again, this is a, another test of how we can be a honeybee in these types of provoking situations. And we can learn so much. It's one of our gurus. And this essentially is the essence of our um, tradition. It's uh, compassion. Compassion is really what it comes down to. Um, even if you look at this word compassion, uh, come means together and passion actually comes from the Latin pati, which means to suffer. So compassion means to suffer with someone. And the Sanskrit translation of compassion is where you actually get the word kampa. And kampa means to shake. Just like when we sing Mangalarti every morning, Romancha Kampa, Sutananga Bajo, means you shake for the Lord. So Anukampa uh, means you shake for somebody. It's our translation of what compassion is. When we can truly shake for someone, when we can feel their suffering, that is uh, true compassion at that point. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he has explained that the Sarvatra Dharma, the essence to all religions, comes down to two things. It's to develop Nam Ruchi, which is taste for the holy name, and it's to have Jiva Doya. Doya means uh, compassion, and uh, Jiva means the living entities. So this is how we have to truly live our lives um, in order to perfect our lives, in order to become sweet like the honeybee. And when we think of sweetness, when we think about this compassion, we have to think about Srila Prabhupada at all times. We sing every single day. Namaste, Namaste Saraswati Deve. That we are very grateful to Srila Prabhupada because out of his compassion, he has come to the West. And why has he come to the West? To save us from voidism and impersonalism. And I truly believe that this impersonalism is not just our connection with God. And this is why Srila Prabhupada has come so to clear our um, uh, conflicts with uh, our connection with uh, the Lord, but also in personal in personalism amongst ourselves. We can sometimes be very impersonal with our friends, with our family, with our co-workers, with whoever. And if we really want to measure success, we have to measure it with that ability to be personal. This is the definition of success in my eyes. The more you can be personal with somebody, that's uh, the more uh, Vaishnava you are. And you, you can even see in just um, a mundane sense, what's the difference between a, a good teacher and a bad teacher? Uh, a good teacher is, is personal. They don't put you in a box, but they really try to see what is it that you need. What's the difference between a good doctor and a bad doctor? A good doctor is personal. It doesn't just prescribe to you what it's been told, but it actually checks your symptoms. So in the same way, if we can become more personal in our dealings, then that is how we truly stand out as devotees and we fulfill the prophecy of Srila Prabhupada. And then we can spread this personalism in all corners of the world. And if we read um, Bhagavad Gita chapter 12, which I believe is the heart of Bhagavad Gita, it's situated right in the center. And um, it's all on the processes of bhakti yoga. The chapter starts off with Arjuna asking, Arjuna uvacha evam satata yukta ye bhakta stampa rupashate ye chapi aksharama vyaktam te shakya yoga vittam uh, Arjuna is asking, uh, what's better? What's better? Um, Arjuna Is it better to worship you in your personal form or is it better to um, worship you in your avaktya, uh, avaktya form, which is uh, impersonal form? 
And how does Krishna respond? He says, Sri Bhaganovacha, Maya Vesha Mano Yemam, Nitya Yukta Upashate, Shariyam Parayopita, Steme Yukta Tumomataha, that it's better to actually worship me in my personal form. And those that worship me in my impersonal form, they eventually come to me. But what is the problem? The problem is Klesha Dikaras. Klesha. Klesha means. Uh, troublesome. It means miseries. And those that follow the impersonal path, it's very troublesome. Um, and this material world is known as Ashesha Klesha. Ashesha means unlimited. There's unlimited miseries. But what Srila Prabhupada has given us through his compassion is this principle of bhakti, which automatically has six characteristics explained by Rupa Goswami. And the first characteristic is called Kleshagni. Uh, Agni means fire. So through that fire, it burns away all of our Kleshas, all of our miseries, all of the troubles that we experience. This is one of the side effects to the principle of Bhakti. And then uh, there's five more um, that I can also mention. The second is Shubhada. Shubhada means all good fortune, all auspiciousness comes as well when you uh, practice the principles of bhakti. And then moksha laguta krit, that this impersonalism, that this merging into the oneness, it becomes so insignificant. We don't even care about it anymore. It, it's so minor. And it's actually mentioned in the Shastras that if you take all of the uh, pleasures of the material world and you put it in a bucket and then you put the feeling of impersonal Brahman, like merging into that Brahman oneness, you put that feeling into the bucket as well. And then you multiply that bucket by 10 million. It does not compare to one drop of bhakti. So just think how fortunate we are to have this bhakti yoga process and what Srila Prabhupada has given us, being the honeybee that he is, bringing us this nectar so we can truly experience the highest joy in life. And so that is the third characteristic of bhakti, that uh, moksha laguta krit, that moksha becomes insignificant. And then the fourth characteristic is something called sudur labaha. So dur labaha, dur, dur means difficult, like durga, even in English, we have the word endure. And um, uh, it's just a it's, a, it's a word that means difficulty. Um, and anytime you put su in front of a Sanskrit word, it becomes even more intensified. Like I have a, a dear God friend um, in London, he's a Sankirtan soldier named Sutapa. So his name, Tapa means austerity, but sutapa means intense austerity. So again, sudurlaba, it is basically saying that this bhakti is very difficult to obtain. It's very difficult to receive. And so us being in this process of bhakti yoga, we're very, 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 very fortunate. Fortunate times 10 million. And um, this is another characteristic. And just to wrap it up with the last two characteristics of bhakti, just so you guys know, um, very important to Rupa Goswami and all the acharyas. It's good that we know this. Um, the fifth is Sandrananda uh, Visheshatma. That is such, such intense joy that comes by being part of this bhakti yoga tradition. Um, it's this feeling that cannot be bought by any material wealth, asset, etc. And the last characteristic is Sri Krishna Karshani, which means that it's the only way, it's the sole way that we can truly uh, please Lord Krishna and receive his uh, mercy. So uh, once again, we are again very lucky to be just be part of this movement of compassion. And at that point, you be basically become a walking instrument. Us being part of this bhakti yoga tradition, anywhere we go, any place that we tend to go, anybody that we meet, we can't help but share. And just by sharing a little bit, it's able to spark people's interest um, to a very high degree. 
like uh, just recently, I'll tell you guys a little something. I've been uh, taking vocal lessons because uh, I've been for a very long time uh, producing music. I've been making beats, just like I was telling you about my story of mixing Eastern sounds with hip hop. But now I'm taking vocal lessons because I'm also um, being more behind the microphone and I'm being in the studio and I'm currently recording songs. So in order for me to really perfect this, I wanted to take vocal singing lessons. And so I contacted a music teacher who is just, you know, from the outside world. And um, she was like, she was saying in our first assignment, okay, I need you to um, bring a song to the table that you want to sing, um, that you want to learn how to sing. And I didn't know what song to bring her because I don't really listen to the radio songs anymore. So when it was my turn to sing her the song, I actually sang her Jaya Radha Madhava. And she was so enraptured by this song, Jaya Radha Madhava. After I finished the, the song, she was like, that was so beautiful. Like, where can I find the lyrics? What is that song about? Where can I learn about that? And now I'm sending her like YouTube clips of different kirtans and bhajans. And again, this is just, a, it's, it's the byproduct of, a, of somebody in this path of devotional service. We can't help uh, but share. So it's um, very glorious and very special to just be part of this tradition. And this is how we actually make our life perfect. And this is the last point I'll leave with is that this word perfect is so perfect. When you break the word apart, per and fect, fect come from, comes from the Latin facir. And facir means uh, to do. It's where you get the word effective. And then per is actually coming from a Sanskrit root, root which means para. And para means to do something fully. So the word perfect means that you're fully effective. And I have been saying this word perfect every single day. When I sit in the sun and read my Srimad Bhagavatam, I say perfect because I'm being fully effective at this point. There's nothing else I can do on this planet right now than this to make myself fully effective. When I'm in the association of devotees, whether it's physically or whether it's digitally, I feel perfect right now because there's nothing I can do that's greater than what I'm doing right now. I'm fully effective. And when I take my prasadam every day and I watch TV, but what is my TV? I put on the following Prabhupada series. And as I'm eating prasadam, I'm watching Prabhupada move. I'm hearing other disciples speak about Prabhupada. And I say to myself, perfect, because I'm being fully effective. And there's nothing more glorious than this. So like this, devotees, if we can really embrace this type of mood, then we can truly be a honeybee. We can spread this nectar in all four directions. We can become Sankirtan soldiers for Srila Prabhupada, and we can spread the mercy far and wide. So I thank you very much for listening today and truly grateful. And if you guys have any questions, any comments, I would love to answer. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for that really beautiful presentation. Um, I, just an appreciation. Um, I really liked where you took this topic of the concept of the honeybee, um, just because thinking about it, um, the result of a honeybee visiting a flower is that seeds come, which produces more flowers. So when we're talking about just sharing this Krishna consciousness in that way, in a very positive mood, I was thinking, about, you know, honeybees propagate flowers. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I also had a question, um, just where you see the difference between the fault finding or like the fly mentality versus the bee. So um, seeing the good in others. Uh, and it, it seems like there's a risk that it could invite maybe in a less mature application, a certain degree of blindness, uh, which may cause us, let's say, not to make the best decisions in a situation. So how do we cultivate that honeybee mindset, but at the same time being aware that thorns can hurt? 
Yeah, it, it depends where our stance is. Um, we got to ask ourselves what's more important. Is it more important to be right or is it more important to be blissful? And if you're in a managerial position, <clears throat> if you have some type of authority of this sake, then it's important to see the thorns. But if you want to truly um, reach that stage of being uh, a dosha darshi, to uh, simply be in that bliss and ecstasy and sweetness, then we should really get to the core of each and every single devotee and understand that they they are a part and parcel of the Lord. Understand that devotees come from different backgrounds. There might be some traumatic experiences. Things have happened that we don't even know about. We don't know the stories of these devotees and we don't know the stories of these people and what they've gone through and how they act. So having that in mind, I think will help us then to really see um, to a greater degree and just remain in that blissful state because this is something I've also battled with. I'm a person of justice. And when I see things that are kind of out of line, I, I tend to just uh, feel a certain way. But I've realized through the years and through the association of advanced devotees that it's not so important, that we should just simply remain in the bliss. We should simply just remain in the good. And if we are in an authoritarian position, if we have some type of managerial role, then at that point we can come in and see the thorns and try to figure out how to avoid these situations. But other than that, simply find that gold. Um, when you're digging for gold, and I believe this is a phrase from someone like Andrew Carnegie or something, but when you're digging for gold, you're gonna have to go through a lot of dirt but just because a lot of dirt is coming up, that doesn't mean you stop digging for the gold. You got to keep going and keep going until you just find that gold. And I think by Sheshika Prabhu, he has a website called Fan the Spark. And so we just got to find that tiny glimmer of goodness and focus on that. And if we can do that, then this is the Adosha Darshi vision, which Haridas Thakur and many of our great saints have had. And even Srila Prabhupada, imagine him coming to the West and seeing all these hippies. But Prabhupada did not let that stop him. He saw the goodness in others. And because he saw that goodness, now we have a worldwide movement. So this is how we can have that honeybee consciousness in order to spread that consciousness everywhere we go. Beautiful response. Um, and. Uh, the, the example you shared in your talk about the Nasheed was really powerful as well, I think, to, to illustrate the point that you just uh, shared and reiterated. Um, there's another question. Are there any recommendations on how to periodically self-examine if I'm becoming more honeybee-like or more fly-like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I can speak about this from a very practical sense, and I can also speak about it from a very standard devotional sense. The standard devotional sense is simply associate with senior devotees, reveal your mind to them, um, do a lot of sangha, whether it's a phone call, whatever it may be. Uh, we have to reveal our mind and we have to inquire confidentially. These are two out of the six pillars of loving exchanges. And by in, uh, applying this more, then we truly uh, get to know ourselves more. And I, I would say from a practical sense, something I like to do is writing. And I have tons and tons of journals. And whether I'm writing letters to Krishna and Srila Prabhupada, or I'm writing letters to myself, whether I'm making um, different types of uh, just I, like I, I make lists, I make lists, like how can I improve each day? What are the things that I need to do to become better. Uh, and and it's, like, uh, it's like when you put your busy mind on a clear piece of paper, then you make the paper busy and you make your mind clear. It's like taking all this that's here and putting it there and you're able to really see where you're at and you can then figure out how to improve. If we don't start our day with the map, then we're gonna get lost. 
So I think it's also very important to write. And again, this is the uh, mood of the Goswamis. This is the mood of all of our charyas. You look at the poem Srila Prabhupada wrote on the Jaladuta ship uh, to Lord Krishna. So writing is something very important. It's not often talked about, um, but I think we need to speak about it more, that this is part of the Vaishnav tradition. And I think if we can apply the practice and tools of writings, it's very practical and we'll be truly able to see how we're advancing, whether it's a fly or uh, a honey fly or a honey bee. And that's how we'll really uh, fly with life. Yeah. Okay. And there were a couple of comments. Uh, Shruti Priya Mataji writes, His Grace Vaisheshika Vaishesh Prabhu also advises devotees to simply encourage the heck out of everybody and leave a good impression with everyone. Uh, and then there's a comment from YouTube. Uh, Sarvapama Prabhu writes, wonderful, thank you. Um, that's it for the queue of questions, but did you want to ask us questions? <laughs> um, well, I just want to let you guys know, thank you, and uh, really appreciate you uh, having me. It's quite an austerity for me to speak for a long time, because uh, I don't typically speak so much. So I didn't know how I was going to be able to go on the whole hour, but we're almost there. We got a few minutes left and um, truly grateful. And I wish everyone the greatest Krishna conscious year of 2021 um, as can be. And if you, if you really want to think about who you are, you got to simply close your eyes and you got to remember your most ecstatic time in Krishna consciousness. What was that moment? If you can close your eyes and if you can really think, what was that moment where I was feeling my best? I was feeling my 100%. I was feeling this ecstasy because it's that feeling that you had. That is who you really are. And we just need to return to that feeling. We have to be reminded of that feeling more and more because it's there. And the more we can dive into that, then we'll truly remember that we are so grateful to be part of this Krishna consciousness movement. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Um, if there's nothing else, then I will let her conclude a couple of minutes early. Um, but I, I want to thank you so much again for uh, taking this opportunity to speak with all of us uh, and taking time from your many projects to prepare for this. So hopefully this is the first of many more. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Bo. Okay. Uh, this will conclude the Sunday feast. A big thank you to everyone for joining online. Uh, next week will be His Holiness Rampad Swami with the continuation of the Brilliant as the Sun series. We'll be moving on to Third Canto, Chapter 6. <laughs>